All right. <clears throat> so the first question goes like this. According to this is not complete, but let's look at Mark chapter 10, 7 to 8. Verse 7 says, For this reason the man shall leave his father and mother to okay. and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Amen. Amen. So according to this, with these verses in mind, one, why are some married men vulnerable in most areas within their marriage, but very secretive with their phones or other devices? Okay. <laughs> and understand that couples should respect each other's personal items. Yes. However, in a case where there is a genuine urgent need to access the husband's device, for example, your husband is sleeping or indisposed and you genuinely and urgently need to check impromptu for a relative or a friend's telephone number or okay. other important time-bound information. <clears throat> should not be second later to just pick the phone and check. <laughs> uh, I, th I think that was more of a situational question, to be honest. Um, <laughs> I think the first question I'll ask is, what are you doing with your husband's phone anyway? Amen. Amen. But, but <coughs> I think let's go back to that scripture that we read so that we just see what he says exactly, you know. <coughs> Excuse me. He says, a man shall leave his father and his mother and join his wife and two shall be united as one. And says, since there is no longer, since there are no longer two, but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. Now, I think sometimes we take this too, uh, too far. As much as we are one, there's also an individuality that is very unique. Um, if you trust your husband, you would not need to go to his phone. At the same time, if you trust your wife, you will not need to hide your phone. Amen. Amen. Um, one of the things we dealt with at the, um, when we went away as men, was breaking or dealing with secret sins. Except you have something to hide. There's really no point actually hiding or uh, keeping things away from your family. Um, you know, so I, I, I'm trying to understand the point here because it has to do with a unique family or relational dynamics. If you have been looking at your wife's phone before and all of a sudden she was trying to hide it or your husband's phone and all of a sudden he's trying to hide it, that means he's trying to hide something. The Bible talks about they being naked and not ashamed. So if you're hiding something, what are you hiding? <clears throat> Amen. Amen. At the same time, you know, I must say to you women that sometimes men want to manage information. Manage information in the sense that they have to deliver certain information in time, in, 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 in within time, not just out of time, you know. And then it looks, sometimes it can be taken out of context where that is not delivered accurately. For example, um, in a state, in a case of bereavement of a close family member, the man may want to just take his time to see how he can deliver that news to the wife and all that. And then you rush to his phone and just pick it and then look at it and you can, and you see a message there and that knocks you out. Are you getting the point? So what I'm saying in essence is that we must be careful about being secretive. I'll tell you a story and then I'll round this up. This was a story I heard, um, I think, last week. And the story was simple. <clears throat> you had this loving couple who one day their husband decided to rummage through some of the things the wife had at home when the wife was not around. And then saw this box and opened the box and the box was full of love letters. Love letters of, you know, it looks like there was a secret love relationship between 
whoever has written this letter and the person who has the letter. And the husband, after reading those letters, really got distraught. That a woman I've married for 25 years and I've loved so much, I've cared for so much, has actually a secret relationship. And then it happened that this man quietly allowed things to go. The woman came back home, um, had her meal and all that. And at night, because of the grievances, the anger, the resentment, this man kind of used the pillow to, you know, is this suffocate the woman and she died amen now this is this is some of these some of the dangers okay be very careful because we must live a life of trust and trust god after the funeral you know the man was at home one day and the woman's best friend showed up and said sir I hope you're coping well. Um, but please, there's a box that I secretly gave your wife to keep from me. Um, it's a box that I cherish so much. It has some letters in it. Please, could I have it? Now, can you see the orientation? Because there was some secrecy going on. And that's why I say to people, there's no point hiding anything. Run an open relationship. If your disagreement is, there's a disagreement, disagree openly. Amen. Amen. Ask questions. Communicate. Are you getting it? At the same time, let's learn to show respect for one another. You can't just pick up my phone because you're my husband, my, my, you're my wife. That's rude. Don't do that. That's my personal property. Amen. I know we are married, but if you say to me, oh, can I check your phone? I need to pick up this information. Oh, yeah, why not? Go ahead. Are you getting what I'm saying? But that you pick up that because it's private, you see. So don't say that there's nothing private because we are married. But you find out that that kind of relationship, they say there's nothing private, but they're still keeping their money private. Do you understand what I'm saying? So I think it's all about the balance. Praise God. Hallelujah. All right. I think the second question you've answered also, mm -hmm. because it's about the same thing. Um, all right. But then the third one is related to it. Okay. What really does transparency and openness in marriage entail? Is there a limit to what should be known to each other in the different areas of their marriage? It is finances, children matters, close friends, career goals, health, etc. Should there be any secret between couples? <clears throat> the Bible says naked and not ashamed. I would rather you come naked and open with all your dirts. If they're going to love you, let them love you with all the dirts. If they are not, that's it. So before you even get married, make sure everything is in the open. You know, there's nobody without a past. The point, the painful bit is the past that was discovered. Being, you know, in a way of where you're trying to hide information or conceal information and it's discovered. That is what actually breaks trust. Are you getting it? Issues like, you know, I disagree with you don't necessarily break trust. They just bring disagreements. And um, <laughs> I'm sure we have so many couples here that can tell me that uh, we don't agree on everything. And that's okay. But that there is no secrecy in this whole thing. I think that is key. And we must ensure that the Bible is naked, they were naked. And they were not what? Ashamed. If you are struggling with an issue, say I'm struggling with an issue. If you have woman problem, 
let your wife know so that he can satisfy, she can satisfy you very well. And then you don't have to look outside. Are you getting what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So we have to learn to cover one another. And of course, that's where transparency comes into play. You know, um, one, of the, one of the things I want to actually pick out from there is actually close friends. Close friends, which is very key. You know, <clears throat> the issue of close friends. Um, I'd always suggest you have common friends. Not just common friends, but friends that both of you approve of. Friends that both of you approve of. Just because he's your friend from secondary school does not mean that he's continued to be your friend. Amen. Amen. The moment your husband does not approve of you, better let go. Otherwise, he'll be your mistress. Amen. He'll be, he'll be the man's mistress very soon. So we've got to learn to balance these things. And it has to do with what? Submitting to one another. The Bible used the word submit. It means whatever you have, put it forward. Submit it. <laughs> you too, submit it. Let's see it all. You know? And we begin to grow in trust. And trust thrives in an environment where there is transparency. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. All right, so we're moving to other Bible questions. Okay, so we're done with marriage. We're done with marriage. Praise There's God. Those questions that were sending us additional from last week. Okay. All right, doesn't all religion teach the same? Is it not one God all religion refers to, but worship in different ways? I came to having different perspectives of the same <laughs> God. <clears throat> Are you really, I'm not sure if you're really ready for me to answer this question. Yes, all religion teach the same thing, pretty much. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Don't fight, don't kill, you know, look after your neighbor and all that. That's all religion teaches. And all religion tend to ascribe to similar God. Amen. Amen. But this is where it differs. The God of the Bible is different from the God of any religion. I don't know whether you get the picture. The God of the Bible is different from the God of any religion. Now, I want you to understand this. Because it is the concept of religion that we're trying to satisfy here. Mm. All religion will ascribe to God. Let me tell you the birth of religion. Genesis chapter 4. Quickly. The last verse there. Genesis chapter 4. The very last verse. If I let me just read it because of time. It says what? And as for Seth, to him also, also a son was born, and the name him what? Enosh. <clears throat> then men began to call on who? The, the name, name of, the of the Lord. The question is, is which Lord? Which Lord? Because you will have to go to Exodus, I'll be, I'm going to be teaching on this next week. So, um, I'm going to be teaching on this next week. Um, uh, secret of, a secret to infected prayer or whatever, however I want to put it. The Lord will lead us to put it. 
But that, men don't know who they were calling on. Which Lord is it? Because it was only in Exodus that God appeared to Moses and he said this, Exodus 6. He said, to your fathers I had not revealed myself as Lord. They know me as what? Almighty God. They don't know me as Lord. The Bible says in Romans, it says, how can they believe in whom they have not known? No. Amen. Amen. So we need to be careful with that word religion. In fact, the word religion is from the Greek word religio. Religio means to tie back, to tie down. So religion actually ties you down. Amen. Amen. This is where it differs. There is Christianity that is a religion. And I'm not a member of it. Amen. Amen. Is not different from Islam. <laughs> it's not different from Hindu. If you go to government and the corrupt guys in, in power and all that, you will find people of various religions there. And all of them are doing the same thing. Are you getting it? So now let me deal with this and then and let me let me tie it up this way. The Christianity of the Bible is a relationship, not religion. Jesus is not the founder of Christianity. There's no scripture for that. He gave his only begotten son that whoever does what? Believe. believe in him. Who did he give it to? The whole world. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Therefore, <clears throat> the God of this Christianity I'm talking about is different from the God of any and every religion. Amen. Amen. Therefore, what is Christianity? Christianity is simply kingdom citizenship. A kingdom citizen that has a relationship with the king and direct access to the king through Jesus Christ. Void of any pretense and hypocrisy with a sole intention. Who has a sole intention? Of doing and fulfilling the will and the purpose of their father. The king is the father of the citizen. Are you getting me? I'll expound this more next week because it's part of what I'm going to be touching on. Amen? Amen. So, in summary, yes, most religions ascribe to the same thing. But please don't confuse religion with the relationship we have in Jesus Christ. There are two different things, two parallel things. The fact that we all meet in church does not mean everybody have this, is, is ascribed to the same thing. Amen. Amen. We have religious Christians and we have relational Christians. You have to define which one you are. And the two of them don't ascribe to the same God.
I taught on a series once, the idol called God. Please find it and listen to it. The idol called God. It's a four-part series. Find it and listen to it. It will really, really help you and open your minds to these things. Amen. Amen. All right, so uh, can you throw more light on the issue of being born again? Water baptism and Holy Communion. Okay. In some churches, people are not allowed to take Holy Communion except they are water baptized. So where does the Influencers Church stand on this? Where does the Influencers Church stand on this? Okay. Um, I think there is a slight confusion here. And um, let, me, let me put some background. That there is no scripture that puts that order. Okay? That order is not scriptural. And it doesn't mean that that order is wrong. Now, in a lot of the... In a lot of big churches or established churches and conservative churches, there's what you call the church synod. Okay? That's the legislative body that helps to define legislations, practices, and all that, and they help to interpret practices based on their understanding of the scripture that the entire church body must follow. Do you get it? Now, in some places, they will tell you, you must be what? Uh, uh, born again and then water baptized before you have the communion. No, nothing of that nature, please. The scripture does not state that are you getting it the scripture does not state that communion yes is a divine uh, 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 um, uh, sacrament that god has given jesus left behind to communicate that we must continue to discern his body Okay, it's a powerful tool. It's a powerful uh, uh, sacrament that God has given to us. However, you don't have to be water baptized before you have your communion. Amen. Amen. You don't have to be water baptized before you have communion. I spent about six weeks, is it, teaching on the Holy Communion? Yeah. So please, go back, listen to that whole six weeks message. It will give you a complete concept of Holy Communion. This order is simply based on the synod order of the church that, you know, you are referring to. It is not scriptural. However, it's also not wrong. This is what they want to practice. And that's, what they, that's the order they want to put it. And that's the order they put it. You remember in the scripture, um, the elders in the book of Acts, they believe that you have to be water baptized. And then you are baptized in the Holy Spirit. That was their practice. Eh? That was what they accepted to be. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit messed their practice up. When Peter went to the house of Cornelius, while he was speaking, the Holy Ghost came upon them. Yep. And he said, ah! <laughs> uh, who can stop these ones from being uh, baptized? Because the Holy Spirit had just confused their orientation. No, it should be the other way around. They should believe and be baptized so that the times of refreshing will come upon them and then they will receive the Holy Spirit that was promised. This was what Paul, I mean, Peter believed. That was what he preached. That was one of his first messages. And then he went to Cornelius' house. The Holy Spirit came upon them. Before he was <laughs> confused the whole thing. So, we put this order, and sometimes it becomes a shackle. Are you getting it? Yep. So, there is no, this is a practice of a particular denomination. It is not wrong, but at the same time, 
is not a scriptural order, but every activity there is what? Scriptural. Do you? I don't know if that's clear. Okay, thank you. So, should a congregation be led by a man and wife, as is widely practiced today? Widely or, practiced. Or should they be led by elders, as seen in the scriptures? It doesn't <laughs> matter spiritually. Um, okay. <clears throat> I think we must understand that every purpose of God has got divine templates. And like the previous question, let's not make the mistake of putting everybody in one hole. Are you getting me? Because, yes, the, the first church was by a council of elders, the church in Jerusalem. The second church in Antioch was not elders, they were a council of believers. You had Nigel, you had uh, 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 Paul there, you had Barnabas, you had a few other guys in that church. Council of believers, not council of elders, but at the same time, they were submitted to the home church of Jerusalem. Yeah. But when... Paul and Barnabas were released to go to the old Asian minor, what you found was a situation where churches were being planted. Okay? And you have various churches planted in homes. In fact, if you go to the book of Romans, you will hear great so-so-and-so. Is it transformer and transformer? Uh, and the church in there, these are husband and wives, okay, in their house, the church in their home. That's one template. Then you have the church in Ephesus that was pastored by Timothy. That's another template. Mm -hmm. You have another church that was in Laodicea that was pastored by uh, Archippus. That's another church. You have the church in Crete that was pastored by Titus. Mm -hmm. That's another church. Are you getting it? Yep. These ones were young boys that Paul got, but there were some other churches that they were pastored by. Uh, fa family. Fa by a family, couple. the a couple. You had um, what's their name? Um, these two couple Agrippa, that Agrippa. Um, no, like Philippa and Agrippa they were kings. Uh, <laughs> um, they looked at they they, they taught uh, um, and then. No, 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 no. no and Safira were the ones who died. Sorry, <laughs> in Acts. Aquila and Pris Priscilla, thank you, thank you. We have many Bible readers here, God bless you. Aquila and Priscilla, are you getting it? They were in ministry as well. Aquila was as called as Priscilla, amen. Aquila was as called, sorry, Priscilla was as called as Aquila. Both of them were called into ministry. That some point for two years they were part of the ministry team of um, of, of Paul. Are you getting it? They ran the ministry on behalf of Paul and they helped Paul and supported Paul a lot. So what I'm saying in essence is God has various templates for ministry. With reference to the Influencers Church, we believe that for you to spearhead a ministry, you must be called in that regard. I spent about 10 weeks teaching on um, kingdom order of the church. Go and listen to that. One of the key things that qualifies you to pastor a church is number one, you must have a mandate to do that. If you don't have a mandate to pastor a church, there's no business, you don't have a business pastoring a church. There must be a divine order, divine mandate for you to do that. Divine instruction for you to do that. Amen. Amen. However it comes, that's down to your persuasion. But that is just what it is. Hallelujah. So Amen. if you're not called, like for example here, I'm called. <clears throat> My wife is not called. She's not called to the fivefold ministries. She looks after the children's ministry. But guess what? <laughs> She's the one getting invitations to go and preach outside. I'm not the one getting invitations to go and preach. I sit down in my own house, in my room. And you say, ah, they've asked me to come and share here. I say, ah, go, go and share. 
Are you getting it? Yep. Maybe God is opening doors for our own ministry. That's fine. Are you getting the point? Yes, so sir. let's not get hung up on his and his frameworks and, you know, man and wife, this thing. I know that the body of Christ have been bastardized in terms of, you know, counterfeits and all that. But that does not mean that the truth and the authentics, they are not there. If my wife is called, she will be called into ministry. Yeah, she will work with me. We'll frontline it together. Praise God. Hallelujah. I was saying to the men during the weekend, I said, I know you call my wife pastor because of, uh, out of respect, but she's not. That's the candid truth. Her name is Dr. Linda. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. Thank you for that. All right, move to the next question. How are we bound by time and yet God lives in eternity? And we are spirit beings made in the image and likeness of God. Yes. I'm so confused about this. Okay. You talked about this sometime last year on the Friday prayer and Bible teaching. Can you explain why we are limited by time? Our life stays a long time. <laughs> I've forgotten many things. <laughs> but anyway, you see, I want to make you understand that, number one, the first thing God created was time. He said, let there be light, and there was light. And then, the, sorry, the second thing God created, God did was what? He separated the light and the darkness. And he called the light what? Day. And the night? Night. And the, and the darkness, night. Time began immediately. Are you getting it? So everything he now created from then on was bound by what? Time. In the evening and in the morning, where the what? First day. Hallelujah. Amen. And you know, that's very simple. And then uh, a man start, started and says, in the day you, 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 you eat of these, you will surely what? Die. It means that time is tied to death. Are you getting it? That's another dimension of it. So in the day you, you, you eat of these, your time begins to tick. And in Genesis chapter 5, is it chapter 5 or chapter 4, where he says, I will no longer strive with man and all the, And he says, all the days of man will not be what? First four and, uh, and something. That's what? Time. But now, let me now draw the line here. What is within time is your physical existence on this earth. Your spirit and your soul is timeless, is eternal. Because you are created in the image and in the likeness of God. Man is first and foremost a spirit. Mm -hmm. Therefore, spirits don't die. Please stop this nonsense, fall down and die. <laughs> spirits don't die. Every demon that is over my life, I command you to fall down and die. End or end, no dying. Okay? Demons don't die, spirits don't die, therefore... You can't die. The only thing that dies is what? The physical body that goes down. Are you getting it? And then you, trans you transcend. You transcend. That is the only thing. So that's the only thing that is bound by time. We are an eternal being that is bound by time on this earth. Why? Because God says so. Amen. Amen. I don't think that answers the question. Yep. Perfectly. All right. So next question. Now. Yes. In the Bible, Elijah was a very strong man of God. Okay. And I can imagine what it means to serve God through him. Okay, that's good. Does the fear of a man validate the fear for God? Okay. Especially when the man is a chosen prophet of God. Okay, let me sound this warning. Because we have these... Um, what I would call hero worship syndrome in the church of God. Okay? And we need to be very careful. Not to idolize a man of God. Because men are their best at what? 
Yeah, men. They're still men. And those days when I, a long time ago, so a, a, pre, a, a minister of God advised me, he said, whenever you're following the God's general, always learn to maintain protocol distance because you may never know how he will turn. And at best, he's human. So here is not a case of fear, you know, a man of God. No. The Bible says, they that minister in the word are worthy of what? Double honor. Yes, respect them, honor them. Don't fear them. That's where we get this thing now. When somebody messes up, we say, touch not my anointed. Are you getting it? No. You can call me to account. But that doesn't mean you should disrespect the grace and the anointing I carry. Are you getting what I'm saying? It doesn't mean you should disrespect the grace and the anointing I carry. You honor me for that. But why can't you call me to account? Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, what we see here, what is it? Are you getting it? Mm. I love my father and the Lord and I respect him so much. Well, sometimes when I see him do something and I don't understand it, I'll say, sir, how about this? What's this? What's this? And now tell me, okay, this is it, this is it, this is it. This. I say, oh, makes sense. Are you getting it? But if I'm afraid of him, I'm like, ah, ah, no. Don't fear a man. The Bible says, do not fear a man that can only kill the body. Fear God. You don't fear men. We all know men, but we fear God. I don't know if that's clear enough. Yes. Is it is okay? In in where we are coming from, yes, you know, Africa. <laughs> yes. Um, by the grace of God, there are men that have contacted God, as in the grace of God, upon their lives, and yeah. they have huge members or crowd, you know, uh -huh. and they have them um, big protocols uh -huh. around them, yeah. and um, I think. It's more, the question is more like, where do we draw the line between honor and fear? Okay, let me still reiterate. Amen? Amen. Let me still reiterate. It doesn't matter whether he's spitting fire from his mouth. Are you getting what I'm saying? I have refuted many men of God great as they are who have preached nonsense and I have corrected many things here isn't it mm -hmm. one of those nonsense if you remember <laughs> it was when I said uh, your money is not seed mm -hmm. and everybody was like who sister Deku was really he said ah, who, you mean I will not give seed again <laughs> Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. But the point I'm making is this. Our role is not to fear men. The fact that your culture, that's culture, please. We must separate culture and the word of God. Otherwise, you will lose it. We have seen men of God who will curse people and all that stuff because they've made some choices that are righteous in themselves. Because they don't agree with it, they say they are disobeying. No, 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 you know. I honor you. Are you getting what I'm saying? I honor you. I don't fear you. Fear and respect are two different things. Fear makes you unable to respectfully and lovingly challenge. Are you getting what I'm saying? Huh? I'll give you an example of somebody here. Because we're close. Sister Rita, for example. Oh, she challenges me a lot. <laughs> Are you getting it? But she honors me. I know that. 
Are you getting it? If she doesn't like it, she tell you, ah, pastor, no, 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 I don't like it. I say, so, and then we have to go through the process of explaining and understanding. Are you getting what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But yes. So, you've got to separate culture and the word of God. I, I understand how big it looks. But people put men on a pedestal. Without realizing that these are still men in themselves. I was sharing with you over the weekend. When I said to you that the anointing is so strong. That it does not matter who you are. It will operate. Mm -hmm. But it does not replace character. It does not replace character. I mean, we saw, you, you, you saw how terrible my back was. But whenever I stand to preach, would you, do you, you saw how I just, I am just there. It's like nothing ever happened to me. But when the service ends like this, every session of that man's company, as soon as he ends like this, I just sit down, I'm like, oh. Oh, but when I stand up to preach, the anointing takes over and I don't feel a single pain. And you get what I'm saying? Let's be careful not to idolize people because we replace them with God. And that is why you find many people who say, my pastor said, my pastor said, my pastor said. And I ask you the question, what does the Bible say about this subject first? I don't know whether that's okay. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that. All right, moving on. So Paul condemns the Galatians for following the law of circumcision. Yes. Does that mean that it is wrong to circumcise your children? <laughs> or does it mean that you are following the law of Moses and therefore discrediting the grace of God? Um. Let me just use scripture to answer this. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. Let's see 1 Corinthians. Chapter 7. Verse 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 19. What does he say? Let, what do we have? Okay, I'm just going to read it from here. He says, Circumcision is what? Nothing. And all circumcision is what? Nothing. But keeping the command of God is what matters. You circumcise. You don't circumcise. This was Paul that was writing it. Okay? Mm -hmm. And just to let you know that Paul was not against the circumcision. Because he took Timothy, who was of a Greek descent, because his father was Greek and his mother was Jewish. And because for him to be accepted within the Jewish sectin. So that he can be part of his ministry, he had him circumcised. Because as a, as, a, as a person, you cannot enter the temple as a Jew or as anybody if you're not circumcised. Okay? So that he can access it. If you remember when they, got, when they, when they arrested uh, Paul, the first time that he arrested and got beat, what, was his, what, what, what were the claims? The claim was he brought an uncircumcised person into the temple. So, please, you circumcise, fine, great. You don't circumcise, <laughs> great. What that what matters is what? Obey the word of God. Mm. Thank you for that. So, why is it important to remember that the Lord is a jealous God? 
What role does this attribute play in his pursuit of me? Um, it's like every relationship. Every man and woman love exclusivity. Huh? I know these days we have some abnormality in people's system that you have an open relationship. That's nonsense. That's demonic. And in fact, you don't even need that. Because any relationship that is not based on God's word is a sin. It doesn't matter how you cook it up. It doesn't matter how nice you think you are. So, God is a jealous God because he wants you for himself alone. He doesn't want you dilly-dallying in, 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 in the things of the world and the things as of the devil, having a fellowship with the devil and at the same time fellowship with God. No. He says, I want exclusivity. I want me and you. I want just me and you. Therefore, is it de is default that anybody, including God, who made us in his own image, will be jealous of you, protective of you. I'm protected of, protective of my wife. If I see any man who is looking at him with funny, sorry, I deal with you. Praise God. Hallelujah. That's where you will know. Eh? Okay. <laughs> Uh, good morning, church. I just want to say, ask a question or say, is there a fine line between jealous and obsession or insecurity? Okay, thank you. Now, there are two different things. Okay? There are two different things. Um, you are... The jealousy we're talking about here. Um, for you to earn somebody's trust, yeah. like our God, he is able to provide everything according to his riches, and his riches are unlimited. Yeah. And he's able to give us this, yet we seek for that, for something which he has provided. Yes. So you are, it means you sub, you subducing yourself. It's like being made a prince. And then you said, no, I don't want to be prince. I want to be fetish. I want shams. So you're bringing yourself down. That is annoying. Yes. And that so, is, I think that's God's own perfect, uh, I, I think, perfect. But yeah. human being use the word jealousy for insecurity. No, I think that's and, two different things. Uh, no, yes. but it's the modern days. Term, term, yeah. People use is jealousy <laughs> as insecurity and um, lack of self confidence and obsession. Yeah. Which these three I've just said now, they are all satanic. They are not yeah. real. But yeah. as a mother, being able to provide for my child, I I provide everything she wants and. I will go to extra length. But if she goes down to go and look for something or seek somewhere, something from where what she has in abundance, I have the right to be angry because why I'm angry is because she has belittled me, made exactly. me small. That's exactly. God's own yes. aspect of but it. But you see, let me, oh, that, that's, that's the motherly aspect. But this, this, in this case, the, the, what, when, when you hear that word jealousy, God used it first with the nation of Israel. Amen. Amen. You will notice that whenever God was, to, whenever a prophet or God wanted to talk about the attitude of Israel towards him, you hear that they have played, you said they've played harlotry with other nations. You get because just like how you said, I am a man 
I've given you everything. And then I see you go elsewhere, you know, and then you're sleeping around when I've given you everything you need, man. I've given you everything you need, you know. So that jealousy, it's, it's, that's where it triggers from because God wants ex exclusivity. It, you want it myself, you know. I'll be jealous. Exactly. I'll be jealous if my wife decides today that he's going, she's going to go with another man. I'll be happy. I'll be like, come on, man. I've given you everything. You know, I've, I've given. So that interaction there is the jealousy God is talking about. And he said, I'm a jealous God because I'm jealous for, not against, mm -hmm. I'm jealous for the nation of Israel. I want to protect them with everything I have so that another man will not come and take, another man or God will not come and take the nation away from me. However, it's still the choice. You know, it's still the choice of the nation. It's still the choice of, you know, you use yourself and, uh, and, and your daughter. Uh, it's still the choice of your daughter to make that decision and say, wow, look at what my mom has done for me. I'm going to stay with my mom and stay put with my mom. Do you get Yes. Correct. Correct. To, oh, thanks. When you look in the history of Israel going into yes. exile so many times and suffering, it's based on that. It's based on that because yes. he gave everything. Yes. He loved them too. He still loves them, yes. but he does He's not want to kill yes. them. He just let. He just pull away for some time. So I think when so when you it. talk about uh, if you love people, if they are deviating, you've tried all your best. You've given all. You, you don't they, have to be have angry, no just yes. let them go. Because that's the sign of let you show them you love them. Because you know he knows the front and knows what will happen to them. Yes. They will come back. That's right. So, but there's a fine still a fine difference between insecurity. No, 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 that's different. Jealousy, that's totally different. Um, yes. That's completely lack of different. confidence yes. and there's that's a no different esteem. subject entirely. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. That's completely yes. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have I want to ask a question in respect of um, what you said about being born again, okay. salvation, being born again, then water baptism. Yeah. Most, one, after those three things, is it scriptural that you must speak in tongues? Is it under must? No. Is it I think scripture? I touched this question last week, but um, I'm going to quickly, let me just quickly respond to it so that we go to the next point. Let me just quickly respond to it. It is not a must that you must speak in tongues. Okay? There are two things, two um, engagements with the Holy Spirit. We have the infilling presence of the Holy Spirit. And you have what? The outpouring power of the Holy Spirit. So it's the infilling presence, outpouring power. The infilling presence comes to you when you are born again. That comes into your, when Christ, when Jesus, when Jesus comes to you, the Holy Spirit takes over your heart, takes over you as you become the temple of the living God in whom the Holy Ghost dwells. You are led. The Bible says they that are led by the Spirit of God, they are what? The sons of God. God begins to lead you into sonship and all that and direct you. Are you getting it? That's one. But for you to be a witness and exercise your witness in the area of ministry and showcase yourself as a son of God, what you need is what? The baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit comes with the physical evidence of speaking in tongues. You can, be, like I said last week, you can speak in tongues and not be baptized in the Holy Spirit. That is not God. But you cannot be baptized in the Holy Spirit and say you are baptized in the Holy Spirit without the evidence of speaking in tongues. The physical evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues. However, 
It is not a must. It's your own desire and hunger to go after it and God baptizes you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'm going to join two questions together. Okay. It's on fasting. I've heard some people saying that if you are not baptized by immersion, yes. that you will not enter the kingdom of God. Okay. There is no scripture that said if you are not baptized, whether by water or by the Holy Spirit, you will not enter the kingdom of God. The only thing that permits you into the kingdom of God is to believe in the Lord Jesus and confess him as your Lord and Savior. End of story. Are you born again? Yes. You are in the kingdom already. Do you understand? Huh? You are in the kingdom already. So all those ones are just baseless. Because there's no scripture for that. Okay? I mean, the man, the man who hung on the cross next to Jesus. Eh? You know, after he was just about to die, he knows when, Is that, all? Is that what he did? <laughs> no! He just believed in Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, Today, you will hang out with me in paradise. Are you getting it? Amen. Uh -huh. Amen. Amen. All right. So I'm going to merge two questions into okay. one because of our time. Why do we fast? And does mm -hmm. biblical fasting include abstaining from drink or just food? Okay. Now, why do we fast? Very simply. The way God designed us, and fasting is an ageless thing, okay? The way God designed the flesh, the flesh is a powerful uh, phenomenon that sometimes if we want to access things of the spirit, we have to find a way of suppressing or disciplining our flesh so that we can have some spiritual influences. Okay? Now, this is both where this is not just of God, not, you know, this is both, whether you are Hindu, Christian, any, you are the devil, you are God, anything, doesn't matter. Are you getting it? Everybody fast. Are you getting it? Yeah. Sometimes you will find some cult people and occultic people, they'll be going on a fast. Why? They want to access certain dimension in the spirit, in the dark world. Same thing in the physical, in the, in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in, in the kingdom of light. For you to access the spiritual certain times, it's, you have to kind of discipline your body. And usually, you quieten the flesh, usually by abstinence from food and some pleasures okay mm -hmm. and that will you know uh, please read isaiah um, 58 that will also give you more detail around that um i'm conscious of time now just read isaiah 58 that will give you more conscious additional things that it that entails because you can't say you're fasting and you're in unforgiveness you can't say you're fasting and you're oppressing people you know and all that stuff so you, 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 that, that's basically you, you're suppressing the flesh so that your, your spirit can be able to access certain spiritual dimensions. It's not a quick, faster way to answer prayer. Please. It is not. It simply helps you to position yourself so that you can access God or access the spiritual 
So when you position yourself right, you can access the spiritual and then you can negotiate whatever you want to negotiate with God. Okay? So please, it is not. Because I remember my mom fasting 70 days once. I simply told her. She came one day, I, think, I don't know whether she has crossed maybe 40 something or 30 something days. She came and she was like, man, I'm tired. I said, you know what? I hate your God. Your God is wicked. I don't like your God. And she went, huh? I said, yes. You serve a wicked God. Your God said, I'm hungry. I should fast in my own hunger so that you will give me food. That's not the kind of God I want. But let me tell you the God me I serve. He said, ask and you will receive. He said, if your son is hungry, will you give him a stone? He said, no, you will give him something. He said, if you who are evil know how to do good things, how much your heavenly father will give you good things if you ask him? So why would I be doing all that? So we must understand the concept of fasting. I taught fasting for about two weeks, I think, on one of the Fridays. So if you can find the message on Friday on fasting, then that's fine. But that's it. Number two, to answer that, the next question is, um, uh, 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 whether we drink water or we don't drink water. There is no scripture that says you drink water and there's no scripture that says you shouldn't drink water. Amen. But now if we use Jesus as the basis, the Bible says after he has fasted for 40 days, the Bible says he was what? Hungered. He was hungry. The Bible did not say he was thirsty. Amen. Now, what Moses did was not fasting. What Moses did was an encounter with God. So his own was 40 days. There was no drink. There was no water. No need for it. Why? Because his body was suspended. His spirit was active with God. If you try that, don't worry. There are so many land around that can find you. You'll you be six feet down. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. All right, I'm going to go to infant baptism now. All right. So, why do you condemn infant baptism, seeing that it originated from the Bible, and Peter baptized everyone in Cornelius' house, which is the basis for infant <laughs> baptism? So, <laughs> amen. amen. I didn't realize that uh, Cornelius had a baby then. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. I think let's just go to a scripture and that will answer it for us. Amen. Amen. Let us see Acts chapter 19 so we understand the purpose of water baptism. Acts chapter 19. Um, let me just go to it quickly. Acts chapter 19. Let's see verse... Um, in fact, I'm just going to read from verse 1. Acts chapter 19 from verse 1. It says, While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior region until he reached Ephesus. Uh, and finding some disciples, please follow me on this. And finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Hmm. That means were you baptized in the Holy Spirit when you believed? Because you already have the Holy Spirit indwelling in you. But there is another dimension of the Holy Spirit, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Did you receive it? He said, we have not, as, we, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. Go on. And he said to them, into what were you baptized? So they said to him, they said, into what? John's baptism. Let's go on. Then Paul said, John indeed, John indeed baptized with the baptism of what? Repentance. So John's baptism was water baptism. Remember. John's baptism was water baptism at the Jordan. He dipped people in the water and he brought them out. Mm. It was for what? Repentance. So the baptism of John was a public expression 
of your repentance and your commitment to God. I have decided to follow Jesus. You are baptized. You tell the world, I am baptized. I am baptized. It means what? I am now in Christ Jesus. My life has been given to Jesus. That is it. Now, he says what? Saying to the people, no, let's continue. Stay back on that four. It is saying to the people that they should believe on whom would come after him, that is on Jesus Christ. So baptism is a clear declaration that I believe in Jesus Christ. Verse 5. Verse 5. When they had heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord. How were they baptized in the name of the Lord? Let's go. Come on, come on, quick. And when, and when Paul laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them. And they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Amen. Now, Amen. the baptism we have of John, which is the water baptism, is baptism unto what? Repentance. Um, we have our baby here, Stella. Is she born again? I should confess Jesus as the Lord and Savior. Are you getting it? Be why? Because she's too young to make that decision. Repent and be baptized. She's too young to make that decision. So what are you baptizing into? Are you getting the point? If you have, you know, you have John, you have, um, you know, fortune there. They have an understanding at that age. Do you believe in the Lord Jesus? Yes. Are you, can you, do you want to give your life to Jesus? Yes, I confess Jesus as my Lord and Savior. They can then be baptized because they have some understanding. Because what you're saying invariably is this. Even the children started speaking in tongues. Because very much everybody in the room was speaking in tongues. Mm -hmm. And then they baptized everybody in the room. Are you therefore saying the children too were speaking in tongues? So these are the questions we need to ask ourselves and it's practical. Hallelujah. Amen. So very simply, if this is the yardstick scriptural yardstick which I believe for baptism. If a child of anybody, doesn't matter who the person is, child, adult, whatever. As long as you're at the age where you can make an informed decision about Jesus Christ and you can accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you are ready for baptism. Amen. Or eligible for baptism. Okay. Now I'm going to skip some questions because okay. I believe we've dealt with those ones. I'm going to go to one that says, I want an insight on the church's position on the following societal topics. Okay. Abortion, divorce, <laughs> contraceptives, and euthanasia. Um, the church's position on... Okay, thank you. They put it on there. Number one, abortion is a sin. Okay? Because the Bible says, before you were formed, I knew you. Mm. And the moment you destroy somebody whom God knows, you destroy a destiny. It doesn't matter how you are born. It doesn't matter to whom you are born. God has a purpose. As soon as a man is born, there's an assignment, a divine assignment that has been given to the person. He said, in the lower parts of the belly, he formed us. He did that. And you want to curtail God's move. That's iniquity. That's your will against God's will. I know that you people are promoting my body, my own, or something of that funny nonsense. It doesn't. 
It doesn't change God. That's God's word. Imagine Mary aborting Jesus because she says she's going to be a single mother. Quote. Huh? Or imagine Jeremiah that God said, Before I formed you, I knew you and I ordained you a prophet to the nation. Imagine that. You are both a prophet who wrote a whole 52 chapters plus two, two books. Jeremiah Lamentation. Ah. <laughs> That's that one. Divorce. Well, the Bible says God hates divorce. He hates divorce. But it doesn't mean divorce don't happen. And I think we've touched on divorce last week, isn't it? We deal, dealt a lot with that. So, um, contraceptive. What are you even doing with contraceptive? Except within the bounds of what? Of marriage. But you have to know the kind of contraceptive. It's not contraceptive that are bought. You can prevent pregnancy. Isn't it? If that helps you within marriage, praise God. Fill your boots. But you should know that even with your contraceptive, any child God has ordained to come will force his way through. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. I've seen women who have used contraceptive and the boys still showed up. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> and <laughs> somebody said he has the boy had contraceptive in their hands. When he came, he said, Mama, take. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. But you know, that's the thing. But the thing is this we have two abortions there. I hope it's not uh... yes, repetition. So that, that's Hallelujah. that. Any, if you're trying to prevent pregnancy as a result of extramarital affairs, it's a sin. There's what you call drug use and what you call drug abuse. That's an abuse of purpose. Hallelujah. You can use all these uh, birth controls and all those kind of things, but make sure it's not the one that terminates pregnancy. That's my position. Because the moment that child shows up, God has a plan. Cooperate with it and let it flow. Let it fly. Yes. Sorry. Yeah, go on. Hello? Yep. Um, as a married person, or people uh, trying to prevent pr uh, pregnancy, in the first case, contraceptive prevents a child from coming, and the child is a destiny. So a destiny has been delayed. And whose authority are they doing that? Okay. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. I think we need to be very mindful of this, uh, this because... Um, you are bringing a new debate, Sister Rita. Well, let, me, let, me, let me, let me, let me, let me, I'm, I'm trying, to, I'm, I'm conscious of time. So let me just quickly uh, make this comment. Amen. Amen. Marriage is an agreement between who? Two people. Binding under the covenant of God. The Bible says if two shall agree as touching anything on earth, it shall be done for them. Are you getting it? If they agree, that they will not have a child. They will not have a child. Let me tell you. Let me, let me. This is not, uh, my wife, can, I can call my wife now and she'll tell you. For the first, first four years of our marriage, I didn't, I wasn't ready to have a child. Um, because we were not together. My wife was still back in Nigeria at the time and I was here. And um, also, I didn't want that separation and I didn't want the burden of a child on her while I'm away. And um, I said to her, are you ready to have a baby? She said, no. I said, me too, I'm not ready. I said, do you know what? The Bible says if two shall agree as touching anything, we shall be done. I said, let us agree. And we held hands and prayed. Amen. And for four years, nothing. We did not use contraception. Please, don't do it at home. Uh, this is 
Let it be according to your faith. Are you getting it? Mm -hmm. There was no contraception or anything. And then she, she, she became a bit worried. I said, what are you worried about? He said, ha, for four years now, nothing. And all that. What people, people? I said, people? Are you married to people or you're married to me? And I said, didn't we agree four years ago that you're not going to have a baby? He said, yes. I said, good. The agreement still stands. If you want to unlock it, we can unlock it. And she said, ah, please, let's unlock it. I said, okay, good. Bring your hand. And we prayed. In a few months, she took it. I said, good, I told you. She was like, okay, this is good. When Joanne came, the next thing again, I said, come, let us hold hands. <laughs> if you don't hold hands now, something can happen. And we held hands and we prayed. Are you getting it? It was only after Joshua and now said, come, that time has gone. Go and find yourself something to use. Are you getting it? Only after Joshua, she started to use something. What, there's something you put in your bodies. I'm sorry, but you ladies do, you do a whole lot. And God bless you all, honestly. You do a whole lot, I don't know. But I mean, I just say, go and do something. They say they do something. I don't know it. I'm not so medically inclined. I'm not, I'm completely zero when it comes to that. The only thing I know really is paracetamol and ibuprofen. Or if you're any other thing, you lose me. So I just simply said to her, go and do something. Whatever you do is great. Praise God. As long as, you know, the baby is not there. Are you getting it? So our babies has always been on the basis of agreement. Agreement. So, please, do not bring a baby into this world when you are not agreed. And it doesn't mean that if the baby shows up, God is not, I mean, God, God is not good. God is always good and is, there's a plan for the child. But what I'm saying is this, there must be what? An agreement. So, it's not, that's why I said we, if you, if you, want, if you don't have the faith that, 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 that you know, I operated on, please find something else to prevent it. Are you getting it? Now we are not using faith now. We are using uh, technology to prevent it. Is it technology or what do you call it? Oh. Huh? Science. Thank you. That's the word. Science. Uh, medical whatever. To, to, to prevent the pregnancy. Because I've reached my bus stop. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. All right. And so. uh, the last one, euthanasia. I think euthanasia is um, assisted death. Eh? You have no right to take a man's life. You have no right under heaven to take a man's life. Except God says it's over. Nobody should ever say it's over. It's a humanistic doctrine. It's a humanistic doctrine. He, uh, look at he's so much in pain. Let's just finish it here. Your murderer. Amen. Amen. What? No, it's a human thing. It's, well, we call, in Africa, they will, ultracide, they will send you out of the town. Nobody will speak to you because right. you have to kill somebody. <laughs> Your killer is a killer. But this is a Western world thing. Well, and yeah. So it's still part of the humanistic. Yes. So that's why I say it's humanistic. Yes. Okay. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. All right. We'll come to the last question. Okay. Oh, ha! <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> come to the last question. Um, do you think the church elders and leaders are above sin and wrong to apologize and repent of their faults because of their position? <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. You know, this reminds me of a question um, that uh, <laughs> my sister Chica asked me last week during um, our membership class. She said, um, because one of the things was what, do not expect, one of the things we have in our membership pack is, do not expect in the church that you, not, you will not get offended sometimes. Because, you know, we're people. We'll offend one another. And she, and, she, and she went, and she asked, she was like, 
Pastor, what if you offend me? What do I do? <laughs> and I was like, wow, okay. Nobody has really asked me that question before. And I said, look, we humans. And that's where your question of fear comes into play. Come to me. I am accountable to you as much as you are accountable to me. Ah, but, or rather, this, this is the way I will answer it. Ask Sister Rita. Then she will tell you what to do. <laughs> Amen. Because as she, she will come to me, come to me, if there is any leader, for as long as this church is concerned, there is no leader, including myself, huh, that is above the law. Nobody is above the law. And nobody cannot be put, brought, to, uh, brought, under, uh, uh, brought to book, brought to account. We should be able to do that. Bro Campbell sometimes will pull me aside and say, Pastor, you shouldn't have said that. You should have said it like this and said it like that, said it like this. The ones I agree with him, I'll say, um, no, 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 I don't agree with this one because this, is, this has to be done this way. But this one, I agree with this, I agree with that. Okay, I'll adjust this and I'll adjust that. How do I grow if I don't get feedbacks? How do I grow if I don't get constructive criticism? How do you help your pastor up if you don't help them to grow in this area? They are humans themselves. I don't belong to those pastors who say, touch not my anointed. Touch this one. Don't worry. <laughs> the only thing I always tell people is this. Be careful because they carry something. And honor that grace of God upon their lives. For minister to them. As well as the minister to you. I don't know if that answers the question. Yep. Amen. Amen. And Amen. please expect your pastor to say sorry. Whenever there is an issue. Mm. Amen. Amen. Expect your pastor to say sorry whenever there is an issue. And the, leaders and the leaders to say sorry whenever there is an issue. Are you getting me? Huh? myself and sister Rita, we, we had one falling out one time. And afterwards, I say, she said to me, sorry that this. I said, okay, sorry too that you, you know, we say sorry to one another. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. How we are going strong. Sorry, I was like, I'm using sister Rita too much this afternoon, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're not coming to look at my trouble this, this week. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. <laughs> So that's just it. Amen. 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 <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. Oh, there's one more question. One more question. Okay. But, Hallelujah. Okay. Um, Pastor, please. Uh, I came late and I'm sorry. Um, but when I was coming in, yes. I met a scripture on the board yes. about um, how men as in after Adam and Eve left the Garden of Eden, yes. and after a while, men began to call on God again. That was after Adam yes. sought the face of God, asking for Eve, asking for a son, because um, Cain has been banished, yes. and Abel was yes. gone, yes. Okay. and God gave them sets. So, you know, somehow this period I've been looking into that scripture. So when I came in and I saw it, it touched me, it gladdened my heart. Okay. So, and, um, but you said something as in which Lord are they calling upon? Yes. Because I want clarification. Because okay. I have always thought that um, they started seeking the face of God, okay. and God responded to them and gave them sets. Wait, yes. and um, if you also look at the genealogy of um, Jesus Christ, as in yes, you see it was sets that gave birth to Enoch. 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 Uh, Enoch. Enoch. 
And that was where there priest... There's Enosh and there's Enoch. Okay, I thought it's Enoch. Because that after was where... Enosh, after Enosh, men began to call on the name of the Lord. Enoch was the son of Methuselah. No. In, Methus, um, Methuselah is the son of Enoch. Enoch oh, gave yeah, birth yeah, yeah. to Methuselah. Oh, sorry, the other yeah. way around. Sorry, yeah. apologies. Yes, yeah. you're right. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it was from um, Enoch that priesthood kind of started from, as in men walking with God. Let, let, I'll, I'll, don't get the scripture confused, okay? okay? Praise God. I want us to understand this, please. Don't get the scripture confused. After Seth was born, Enosh was born. Okay, Enosh. Oh, Enoch. Enosh was born. Please put that scripture up. Ge ge uh, Genesis, Genesis chapter four. 4, the very last. Genesis chapter 4, the very last verse, please. Verse 26. Amen. We are way, way beyond time. So, um, but I I'll deal with that scripture next week as well. So, Genesis chapter 4. Let's just put it in the last verse. Have you got it there? Yeah, I've got it here. I'm just, let me just, okay. It says what? And, and as for said, to him a son was born, and named him Enosh, then who? Men. Yeah. Who are the men? Men began to call on the name of the Lord. Chapter 5, verse 1. Let's move to chapter 5, verse 1. Hang on. Capital. I know it's capital. Yeah. I know it's capital. Okay. Let, uh, have you got chapter 5 as 1? Yep. Okay. And then he says this is the book of the genealogy and all that kind of stuff. Now, that is where the whole story of man now began. Okay. Now, when you hear men began to call on the name of the Lord, it means that there was a craving for a supernatural intervention in the affairs of the world. Are you getting it? Don't forget, Seth was not the only guy on earth at the time. We had Cain that had gone to build a city. Are you getting it? Bear in mind that it was not Seth alone that Adam had. He had daughters, sons and daughters as well. Oh, you, want, you need to read that genealogy very well again. Okay? He gave birth to sons and daughters, isn't it? Huh? So there were people other than Seth. The reason why Seth was mentioned was simply because Seth was the one that is key with reference to what? The purpose of the word of God, the purpose of the gospel. You will see in genealogies, you see, he begat this. And he had other sons and daughters. The one that's irrelevant is the one that he called. You know, in, uh, yesterday, one of the things I was teaching, and I said, in the Yoruba language, there are three kinds of children. Okay? Um, because I understand the Yoruba language, I'm not Yoruba, but I, I, I understand it. Now, there are three kinds of children. You have what you call the child, Omo. Then you have what you call Omo Oluabi. That's a child well brought up. Then you now have Olu Omo, which means that's the real dawn, the real child. That nothing happens in that family if that child does not speak. For example, in the house of Jacob, who became the Olu Omo? Joseph. Was it the first child? No. And when the genealogy was written, the Bible says what? The genealogy was of, of, Israel, of Jacob is not documented according to what? But right. He became the first son. Are you getting what I'm saying? So now let's come back to this. What that scripture is simply saying is this. Men began to seek God. Call on the name of the Lord. And that is why I answered the question of religion. Because the Muslims say they are calling on the same God you are calling. Hindus are calling on the same God you are calling. Our Krishnas are calling on the same God you are calling. 
But what they don't have is a revelation. And I'll keep that for next week. And that is what you need to understand. So wait till next week. I will expound it more. And you will see it from the context of God's word. So that you don't just take one scripture and run with it. You must this is, this, is, this is the first principle of Bible study. Don't read your meaning into it. Let scripture interpret scripture. That is why you always see whenever I want to answer a question, I base it on not just one scripture, one, two, three scriptures, except there's a direct answer to it. Are you getting what I'm saying? So let the scripture interpret scripture. So next week... I will show you scriptures that interpret that and why certain things have to happen before you begin to say you are calling on the name of the Lord. Amen. 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 Just as